Good morning. Welcome to the Gibson City United Methodist Church. I extend a warm welcome to all those listening on WGCY this morning. I have a, I'm Kent Biefeld. I'll be your liturgist today. I have three announcements. First, the uh, Halloween signups or sheets are in the narthex. You can contact the office and put your name down to reserve a spot for Halloween. And charge conference will be October 27th at 5.30 via Zoom. The congregation members are invited to attend at home using the link provided in our weekly update. If you need the link, please contact the office. If you can't attend at home and would like to come to the church to participate instead, please contact April in the office and arrangements can be made. And also on Wednesday, November 11th is Veterans Day. We will honor our veterans on Sunday, November 8th. If you have a veteran you would like to honor or remember, please contact the office. Okay, are we ready to praise and worship Jesus? you please stand if you're able and join me in the call to worship. This is Psalm 90, 1 through 6. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you have formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, turn back, O mortal ones. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass which is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, but your wrath we are, by your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set our iniquities before us our secret sins in the light of your countenance for all that our days pass away under your wrath our years come to an end like a sigh the years of our life are three score and ten or even by reason of strength four score yet their span is but toil and trouble they are soon gone and we fly away who considers the power of your anger the awesomeness of your wrath so teach us to number our days, that we may receive a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. We'll now have a opening hymn, The Gift of Love. I want to say something before we get into the hymn. I've invited Ruth. Wait, wait, where are you at, Ruthie? Okay. Ruthie to look for people to be our hymn leaders. Uh, I think since this has hit this pandemic and you're on the radio especially we start playing and 
Bev does a great job. I'm not taking that away from her. But hymns are meant to have words heard through them. So if you are someone, you are someone who likes to sing, and I'm not saying singing well, but if you are one who likes to sing and would take part in leading hymns, yeah, go ahead and point. Sure, Kathy, good. Yeah, nominate people. Yeah, that's great. I like that. All right, just point. Yeah, that's right. Uh, for this first hymn, I have invited my daughter-in-law, our daughter-in-law. This is Annette Fairchild. Welcome her as your first hymn leader. All right. So... Stand anywhere you want to. Just sing. You can take your mask off if you want. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, verses 34 through 46. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one can say a word, no one could say a word in reply, and from that day on no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Kent. Let's give him a nice round of applause. We're not going to be the church that just sits around on our laurels. We're going to celebrate God's love. Yes, you may be seated. Thank you. Anybody uh, like me in the way that you like to know what went on in history on this day? You know, you kind of wonder what's going on in history on this day. Well, once in a while, I'll bring that to you. I'll let you know what's going on or what has happened in history. If you are military-based, in uh, 1984, Reagan decides to uh, declare war on, who do you think? Granada. 
you were right. Okay. Basketball fans here? Okay. I've had this person cook me pancakes. I just want you to know, as a United Methodist man, this person has cooked pancakes for our men's group. His name is Bobby Knight. Today is his birthday. He was born in what year do you think? What, what year do you think he threw the chair? See, so you'd, <laughs> you'd be more apt to know that one. 1940. Okay. Uh, do any of you have a Picasso hanging up in your house? Just... <laughs> His birthday is today. 1881. He lived to be 91. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, the biggest news I could find that related to me, which that's all that matters because we all know it's about me. <laughs> In 1964, on the, how many of you remember Ed Sullivan? Okay, on the Ed Sullivan Show, guess who had their debut this day in 1964? Uh, I knew you were going to go that way. That's what makes Mick Jagger so angry. <laughs> so I gave you a clue who might it be. The Rolling Stones. There it goes. Well, I hope you had fun with that. It's just a way to start something this morning, and you can look all that stuff up as I do on the interweb. All right. So what do you think of Jesus? That's a funny sermon title. But as I explored this passage, it was really about what people thought or who people thought Jesus was. Never recognized by the church of the day, the Jewish people never recognized as the Son of God. Jesus, in fact, to the grave, carried that fact with him. Two weeks ago, I used that example, that passage where Pilate's saying, well, you are a king. And Jesus says, yes, you say I am. It is so. It, I am a king. And here today, we find that confrontation again, and it's very intentional. We're going to get him this time. We're out to get him. And so they have this conversation about uh, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important thing that you and I should do and keep at the top of our list? I think that's helpful information. Think about it. Everything else that we do as a church falls below these two commandments. In fact, many say these are the only two commandments that mattered to Jesus. As long as you were following these two commandments, everything else in life falls in place. Now, see if that works today for you. See if you can play that off. Anything you do in life, if there's anything that supersedes these two commandments, you tell me after church, and we would like to have a little dialogue about that, okay? Those of you on the radio, write me a letter. Let me know what you think it is. Verse 37. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and some people say with all your strength. The passage is with all your mind. I'll take strength, okay? With everything you've got. Everything you have. Not just some things, but everything. And people don't realize that it is with the good things, as well as the hard things. Do you have anything that's hard in your life today? Is anyone struggling with health issues? Oh my, I say that in the midst of COVID-19. Is anyone struggling with a relationship in your life? Is anyone struggling? Oh God, help me for saying this. Whether or not I should be religious, and faithful to my church. 
Hey, I've got to tell you all, not everybody springs out of bed on Sunday morning and says, Woohoo, I get to go to church. <laughs> you, you know, that's true. Uh, I'm one of those that do, though. <laughs> all right. Got it? God first. How many of you have it? God first. Have it. Okay, if you all don't raise your hand right now, I'm going to preach another 10 minutes on this subject. All right, just just letting you know. God first, nothing before God. And the second is like it. And when Jesus says it's like it, it's as important. It matters as much. Love God and, you know what it is, love your neighbor as how does that ferret out? How does that come into being? Well, sounds awful narcissistic though, doesn't it? To love yourself? Go back to Psychology 101 and take a look at your id. See what it says. But there is a strong necessity for you to have a, a healthy relationship with yourself in order to understand what Jesus is talking about. I say it like this. As a pastor, if I'm not healthy, my congregation won't have a chance at being healthy. So if I'm struggling with things, uh, if you come and lay a bunch of stuff on me right before church and tear me down, it's probably going to affect the way I preach. Does that make sense? So, Glenn, wait until after church before you dump on me, okay? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> You'll just try. I know it's hard. I pick on Glenn. I love him. I really do. To love yourself and then love your neighbor or the person that is next to you, that's really where it boils down to. It's not who you choose to be your neighbor. It's literally the, literally the person next to you is your neighbor. Now look, go ahead and look. You can look around. Do you love that person that's sitting next to you as much as you love yourself? I'm guessing no. I, I'm, I'm telling you. Okay. Have a little story to tell you about my mother-in-law. God love her soul. Ella and I were driving around one evening, so she, we picked her up and we're driving through communities looking at Christmas lights. Anybody else like to do that? <clears throat> It'll be here before you know it. And I've got some Christmas lights on sale if you need them today. <laughs> no. We were down in the small town of Newman, Illinois, driving around, and oh, her name was Margie. And Margie's just ooing and on and just having a wonderful time. And she decided it was time to chew a piece of gum. And so we hear her digging around in her purse. And finally she gets quiet back there in the back seat where mother-in-laws belong. Uh, wait, wait, who said that out loud? Oh, I'm sorry. And she taps Ella on the shoulder and says, Ella, I have two pieces of gum. Would you like one? <laughs> I'll never forget that. And after we had dropped her off, we had a really good laugh over that. I was obviously not the neighbor. <laughs> Ella did tear it in half and give me half, though. I was her neighbor. So would you, if you had three people, would you, or how would you? That's the question. That's your neighbor. Would you make sure that they had what you had? that they were taken care of. Love them as deeply as you love yourself. Man. 
Today I realize that throughout my life, there have been, without question, there have been times when I have been more in love with Jesus than at other times. Does that make me a bad person? <clears throat> From the time I was born until kindergarten, I remember who Jesus was. And at that time in my life, <clears throat> I knew for certain that Jesus was God's son. I knew for certain that Jesus loved me. Now, remember this young age, kindergarten and prior. My family made it a point for me to know about him. I wonder about that today. How many young children don't know who Jesus is? And my family, can I grow that a little bit? My family was all of Fooseland. You know, all 12 of us. No, there were well over 100 people there. Now think about 100 people influencing you with love and nurture and kindness. Was that a formative event in my life? Without question. <clears throat> Primarily, this had been communicated to me through music. Okay, how many early Christian song titles can you name? Of course, the top one on the list is... Okay. Who else can think of another one? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. I will make you... Okay. okay, you get my point? I bet we could go on for another 20 minutes just naming those songs. <clears throat> I really liked it when I sang those Jesus songs. It made me feel happy. And I guarantee if we broke into him, if I picked my guitar up and we started singing, you all would feel much more cheerful than you are right now. Okay? Well, then I thought about what happened next in my life. Say, my kindergarten years through my confirmation class, which would have been 11 or 12 for me. And all of a sudden, I grew in an understanding that there was a difference in the Jesus that I knew from being born until kindergarten. And what happened? Church, listen to this. What happened to me from the time of kindergarten through confirmation class? That was the first time I realized, well, if this means me following Jesus, I'm not too sure I want a piece of it. How many of you have been through a confirmation class or a membership class? At 11 years old, it was, it, we had to know all 67 books of the Bible. Okay, did you catch that? 69 books of the Bible, okay. 66 books in the Bible, okay? We had to memorize a little thing called the Apostles' Creed. How many can do that by heart? Uh, I think I can, but I may miss a word or two, okay? Had to memorize that. Had to memorize the Niacin Creed. Why? Because the church said we needed to know it to be a member of the church. I hated confirmation class. We never got any pizza. That would have made a world of difference. In those formative years, I was also told in church that if I moved, I would get waylaid. And not only told, guess what? Guess how I learned it? It was proven. I remember as a young kid. Now, um, imagine me as calm and docile as I am. Imagine that. Imagine your neighbor picking you up by both arms and slamming you back in the pew and saying what? Sit there and be 
be quiet, be still. And if this was the church and what it was evolving to for me to love Jesus, man, I was getting ready to abandon it. Then, after that, I turned into a teenager and a young adult. And look at the, at the group that is truly missing in our church. Look around. Teenagers, how many teenagers we have? Uh, 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 anybody here 21 or under? Uh, yeah, Eric, you're going to go to hell. I'm just telling you for lying in church. Yeah, I know we're on the radio, but I'm just letting you know, buddy. Okay. Yeah, 20, 21 to 13. What did we tell our young people as a church? Uh, this is who Jesus is. This is the church, and you are part of our church, and you're going to adhere to what the church tells you Jesus is. How do you think that set with me? Yeah, it didn't feel good. I didn't stop going to church. This was the time that I met my wife. Yeah, Ella, that's her back there. Ella, the one who was Don Jones's daughter's best friend. Oh, that says a lot, doesn't it? Your pastor, John, uh, Don Jones. Uh, and Debbie Jones, his daughter, and Ella chummed around in Gibson City. Ooh. This is where Ella first came to church on a regular basis. This is where Ella understood she could have communion and not have to belong, that she was welcome here at this altar. This is where Ella stood there with me, right there with me, and said that she would have me for richer, for poorer, better or worse. For how long? Till death. She hadn't killed me yet. <laughs> of my formative years in those age, in that age group, Ella was the biggest positive thing that ever happened to me, and the church affirmed her. The church affirmed me in Christ. Now I'm, I'm going to set Jesus up to be trapped. And we do that, you and I, we do that. We put Jesus in places that doesn't so much bother Jesus because Jesus can handle anything we can throw at him, like this parable. But unfortunately, many times people set Jesus up to fail. Jesus is not living into what their expectations are of Jesus instead of us living into what is expected from Jesus for you and me. And that's the whole crux of this morning's sermon. So how are you supposed to love? Well, you love God, my dad, without question. Just love him. And you love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about you, but I found it a lot easier to love God than my neighbor at times. Have you ever had a neighbor tick you off? Have you ever had a neighbor ignore you and say they don't want anything to do with you? Hmm, I think Jesus can relate to this in his own life. <laughs> For you and I this morning, the challenge is not the love part. We're good at love, aren't we? Watch this. Turn to each other and say those three words that make your heart sing. They are, God loves you. See, I can't stop that. See, there's three words. How long does it take to say, God loves you? Maybe a second and a half. And if I would have let you go, you would have taken another five minutes looking at each other and loving on each other. And that's at the heart of what this passage is. As good as that makes me feel when I hear and say, God loves you, I find calming reassurance in troubled times. 
I find affirmation at the heights of my life. I remember that first moment when Gabe came into this world. I've never felt a greater love from God than when our first child was born. My dad died. I've never felt a greater love than God's love, knowing the reassurance that my father would spend the next beginning in heaven. Oh, that's great stuff. When I was learning how to play the guitar, when I learned to transition two chords, there's not a greater love in my life than that. And Jesus says, if you like it, your neighbor's going to like it as well. All right, it's a short sermon today. Somebody should say amen. Amen, okay. But when I realized this passage and its worth, I made a decision to follow Jesus and to put God first. To the point where some people, <laughs> let me share this with you. I, this isn't written anywhere, but uh, had the honor of burying someone from our first congregation yesterday. A sudden death, and uh, the family was grief stricken. Oh, terribly. And they called and asked if I would come to Mackinac, Illinois, and do his service. Uh, yeah, as, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to make sure everything's right, and I'll, I'll be there. Because that's what we do as preachers. We don't go in other people's territories and say, hey, I'm just coming in to do a funeral. I did make a couple of calls and make sure that uh, no one was going to really be Upset if another preacher came into that territory. And as I was doing that funeral yesterday, I realized the magnificence of what neighbor meant. And You know, if I die and someone would call you, would you go ahead and come over and preach my funeral? Would you do? That, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good neighbor. Would you stand in that person's honor and say they loved Jesus because you knew they did? Because you knew that it was the right thing to do? I hope you would. And some of you, I'll, I'm going to poke Ruthie Davis right now. I'm doing it on purpose. Some people won't get up and lead a hymn. <laughs> I'm just having fun with you, Ruth. I'll lead the last hymn. I promise I will, yeah. I promise I will. You what? No, I shamed you into it. It's not the same. Are you, are you sure? Oh, it worked. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Now you know what kind of preacher I am. All right. But I do thank God for understanding and realizing and thanking God that my early formative years 19 down to 13, the church didn't ruin me. I draw that to our attention. When we come to church and our kids are around, I am so tolerant of kids in church. I've never met a kid yet that can run me out of church. I never have. They'll run you out of church, uh, especially parents. Did you notice that, kids and parents? They're the ones that get most wigged out. But the rest of you sat here and you all know you get to go home and they have to go home with them. <laughs> oh boy. So I can say God is good and all the time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, I mentioned that I did a funeral and we finally laid Ella's brother's ashes to rest yesterday so it was a full day with grieving and I know there are you here today who are grieving in ways that are unbelievable and I do not make light of you and your grief I want to take time today and know that I recognize it that God feels your pain and cries with you so for anyone who's grieving I want to lift them up uh, for anyone who is struggling, I want to lift them up. 
for the farmers who still have crops to combine or gather in or put in the however you want to say it we'll pray for them I also give thanks for those farm families who have completed the harvest isn't that a wonderful feeling schools are still going we're still trying to figure it out we hear from the officials that our numbers are increasing more than ever that death is still happening in this pandemic and please if you have the opportunity to make a difference in some way through social distancing or wearing a mask I would in encourage that strongly and hope I can practice it myself you've got things on your heart that we don't share out loud that is why I give you this opportunity and a musical interlude so you can be that one-on-one -on -one place with Jesus wherever that is so let's take our time and do that this morning let's have our personal prayer time This week, we do have our church charge conference on Tuesday evening. And we will be doing that via teleconferencing, meaning we'll sign in to a specific location. It amazes me, God, how we find ways to continue to be with you. I pray for our district superintendent, Angie Lee. I pray for the work, and I thank you for the work that has been done to get us to the point where we're ready. Bless that time as we meet and we do business of the church, remembering to keep you at the center of it. For the blessings of this past week and for the challenges that were blessings, we thank you. We pray for those who are in lockdown situations, those who are sheltering in home, those who are in facilities that aren't allowing people to visit. And I pray for a peace to come over us and the anxieties that we are dealing with today to subside. I thank you for opportunities and bless us, we pray, that we might be a force of good over evil. As we prepare this week to walk into a time of Halloween, I pray that you would keep us all safe and distanced. I pray for the blessing of what good is becoming out of that holiday. And I pray that you would keep us safe. The following week, we are preparing our hearts for All Saints Day, the day following Halloween this year. And I lift up all families who are remembering the loved ones who have been called home to be with you. As this week unfolds, let us also remember that there are celebrations of weddings and celebrations of lives that have been spent together 
And we stop and give thanks and praise to you. Now, most of all, this moment in our service, not only in-house here, but throughout the airwaves, is a special time that you have provided and seen to it that you have given us words that rest in our hearts. And for just a little bit, we get to share that love that you have placed in them through a prayer. And that prayer is heard like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During our prayer time, I mentioned our church charge conference. <clears throat> I am going to encourage you to log in if you have that capability at home. If you would like to know how, we can send you the link to your email address but you will need to let the conference uh, the office know that you want to be a part of that church charge conference so tomorrow or Tuesday can you contact the office whichever way you're comfortable and we'll give you the the sign-in information the login information and uh, you know you can put a shirt and a tie on and then have like boxer shorts on and sit down and no one will ever know that you didn't fully dress for the church charge conference I can't do that because I'm glad you asked <laughs> uh, Angie and I will be on location here at the church if you are unable or you don't have those capabilities to log on Come and join us. We will socially distance. Uh, we'll just bring it up on a computer screen, and we can participate as a group. Okay? Any questions about that for you? Anyone is welcome to log in in order to vote on specific items. You need to be a member. Was I clear enough there? Okay. <laughs> Well, that's happening this week. Saturday, we're having trick-or-treat for little ones right here in the parking lot. I have a surprise for you. There is allegedly a haunted house showing up. I'm just, just passing it on. I was asked for permission, and I said, I don't see a problem with it. I said, you may want to take the 220 voltage off of the handrail, though. All right. <laughs> so it will be a good time. Still room. The sign-up sheets are right on the other side of the bulletin. Did you notice the bulletin? Okay, just letting you know, keeping you connected. So you can sign up and take one of those spots. If you would like to be a goon or a ghoul that helps people line up and socially distance, we need some folks for that too. All right. I warn you, I've told you, it's going to be really loud around the parsonage. So expect it. Don't come up to me and say, could you turn the music down? It's a little loud. Because it ain't going to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, good people. I think we're there. Uh, I ask God to remember us as we continue to make our personal sacrifices and we personally decide to support missions of the church. I ask God to bless you richly and deeply as you consider supporting the offering this morning. Because of social distancing, we still have our box up right here on the table. And as you depart and you would like to make your offering, that's the place to do it. So everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Now say amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're there. Uh, Ruthie, have you changed your mind? No. Let's give Ruth a nice round of applause. Our closing hymn. It's verse 1 and 4. Only two verses, Ruth. 
And I'm sure you grew up with this hymn. I love it. I'll invite you to stand and we will sing. God be with you till we meet again. <laughs> Look who's up here, Ruth Davis. God be with you till we meet again. Now you get to move a little till we meet, till we meet. Careful Methodists, don't move. At Jesus. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet. God be with you till we meet again. Verse 4. God be with you till we When life's perils thick confront you, put his arms unfailing round you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus. Till we meet. God be with you till we meet again. You sounded pretty good, Ruthie. Everyone who thinks she needs to do it again, raise your hand. Oh, that's that support, Ruth. I know. God loves us. Uh, God loves you too, she says that as she grits her teeth. God loves you. All right, well, that's good. Yeah, you can go down if you want, unless you want to sing with me. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant. Remember, God loves you. Amen. <laughs>